Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jeanette. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Earlier this year, I joined a long serpentine queue to view the fashion world of Jean-Paul Gaultier from sidewalk to catwalk. Gaultier's show at Melbourne's National Gallery of Victoria broke all previous attendance records. I think it was around 250,000 by the, year's e the exhibition end. To enter the exhibition was to be awestruck, to experience awe at the sheer power of human imagination, and to see delight, shock, and surprise reflected on people's faces, including my own, as we wandered through one sensational gallery after another. On one of the exhibition panels, Galtier had described his creative response. Oh, hold on, I should, should put... Something's happened here. I should put the slides up. On one of the exhibition panels, Galtier had described his creative response to the reinterpretation of religious dress as being one of devout irreverence. That phrase leaped out at me and stayed long after the exhibition experience. To me, in this context, devout signifies a kind of respect a nod to tradition, to history, to cultural specificity, and to the intelligence of the people with whom you work and upon whom you depend, a kind of commitment. Irreverence is what he, Gautier, needs in order to create the new. Irreverence is an antidote to the comfort of perceived success and the kind of institutional ennui that rewards followers rather than thinkers. By chance, a week or so ago, my friend and colleague Sally Gray and I spent a Saturday afternoon at the open studio of a place called Signature Prints in Sydney. The founders of Signature Prints had the perspicacity to acquire original silk screen frames and film, film positives from the largely forgotten Florence Broadhurst image library and represent Broadhurst's striking decorative designs to a contemporary audience. While there, Sally and I were fortunate enough to sit down with journalist and writer Helen O'Neill, who's written a definitive book about Broadhurst and her creative output, and who was on hand to talk to people like us. Suffice to say, although her history is Shakespearean, that Broadhurst was born in Mount Perry in rural Queensland. And you're gonna to have to help me out here. I have no idea where Mount Perry is in 1899. And it seems that she spent the rest of her life fleeing her origins and reinventing her history. She won a singing competition in 1915 and started performing in towns and cities across Queensland. By the early 20s, 1920s, she was performing in India, Southeast Asia, and China. She founded a modern academy, academy of Arts in Shanghai in 1926, where she taught, where she was offering tuition in violin, piano forte, voice production, modern ball, ballroom dancing, classical dancing, musical culture, and journalism. She was never one to settle, and she moved to London and reinvented herself in 1933 as Madame Pellier and ran a dress salon in Bond Street. The Second World War devastated commerce in London, and Broadhurst ended up back in Australia in Sydney, broke, and living in a shared house with an alcoholic printmaker. Now, you're probably wondering where I'm going with this from an innovation point of view. <laughs> But things now get st start to get pretty interesting. With a back against the wall and no obvious opportunities in sight, she combined her prodigious capacity for invention with the material conditions at hand. A printmaker, his connections, and a post-war market ripe for luxury. 
She went on to employ talented illustrators who could interpret her visual ideas and an expert printmaker who could execute them. From 1959 to her unsolved murder in 1978, yes, I did say unsolved murder, her studio produced remarkable wallpapers and prints that were distributed worldwide. Neither Gautier nor Broadhurst came from rich, privileged backgrounds, and neither of them could have achieved business success alone. What Gautier and Broadhurst show is that innovation requires some kind of creative intelligence or spark. Innovation is always contextual and bounded by history, and it's animated by problem solving, adapting to circumstances, and being open to the world. What becomes innovation can never be predicted in advance. In a sense, it isn't innovation that Gautier or Broadhurst was seeking or sought. It was a creative life. Personally, I'd rather study Jean-Paul Gaultier for an insight into innovation than consult the latest tome from the Harvard Business School. I would rather hang out with someone who uses the phrase devoutly irreverent than the so-called innovation experts who describe their field of knowledge as, I quote, number one. What do they say in court? Ev you know, evidentiary statement number one. Innovation can be viewed as the application of better solutions that meet new requirements, inarticulated needs, or existing market needs. Number two, the term innovation can be defined as something original and more effective and, as a consequence, new that breaks into the market or society. Number three, innovation may be linked to positive changes in efficiency, productivity, quality, competitiveness, and market share. And number four, Innovation thrives in a culture that is not afraid of risk-taking, promotes the value of experimenting, is adaptable and rewards enterprise. Innovation usually needs to be led from the top. That last quote is from an Australian government website. And I can just say, I wouldn't be going to the Australian government for insight into risk-taking. <laughs> Unless, of course, I went to the one aspect of the Australian government that does know about risk-taking and innovation, and that's the National Library of Australia. Innovation here, in all of these definitions, is pitched as a process almost devoid of human imagination, creativity, drama, conflict, and the rich complexity of collaborative endeavour. We're here today to ask and explore how innovation can touch upon and possibly transform the specific challenges facing public libraries. On the basis of my exposure to contemporary public libraries, and I'm not a public librarian or a public library manager, I believe that the potential for being innovative is endless. And for what it's worth, I'm gonna share a few ideas with you today, but of course we'll be talking more about that in the afternoon. But before I do so, I think a bit of interrogation of the term innovation is warranted. And I'm gonna do this using three lenses. You'll see throughout the talk that I quite like this word lenses. I seem to use it quite a bit. Innovation is an historical phenomenon. Innovation as a potential way to reframe the core values and ideals that animate the public library project. That sounds very pompous, I hope I can explain that. And innovation as a conscious strategy mindset approach and discipline. Let's start with number one, innovation as an historical phenomenon. Just think for a moment. Actually, I don't want you to think too hard, and I don't mind a bit of lazy thinking when it comes to this next question, actually. The thought, first thought that comes into your mind when you think of innovation, unfiltered, the first thought. Don't think too hard, it's only a couple of seconds, and then I'm just gonna ask you what came into your mind. Does anyone want to volunteer? Jeanette? Idea. Idea? Yep. Creativity. Creativity. Transformation. Transformation. Okay, what companies or products come into your mind when you think about innovation? Apple? Jumps. Jumps. My great grandfather invented that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, who else? 
of that, but we've had the jump stump plow. Google, beautiful, yeah. Well, uh, and probably uh, um, IKEA, whatever, those sorts of things. They tend to be the things that come to mind when we think about the companies and products who are innovative. We associate almost by default with companies like Apple, Google, Ikea and Facebook, with new apps, online interfaces, games, gadgets, furniture and buildings. There's no denying the scale of innovation these companies and products, and products embody. But, like the quotes I've used already, they funnel the mind down a commercial track. And business thinking and practice is saturated with a set of values which inevitably privileges profit, hierarchy, a kind of masculine heroic ethic, and the relentless needs of capital above all else. What worries me about this innovation frame and the prophets who speak in its name, and I, I, I would think the same as you if, if someone asked me about innovation, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a kind of default thing in which we've become embedded, is that by reinforcing it and them with our continued attention and adulation, we inadvertently overlook and sideline the different non-commercial ways in which libraries are already innovating in small and big ways everywhere right now across Australia and around the world. We lose the opportunity to see, celebrate and build on what's already there staring us in the face. History and context are important. Gautier's wonderfully transgressive couture would not have been possible without the eruption of feminism and gay liberation. Broadhurst may have been an eccentric genius in another historical era, but the specificity of her decorative designs was made possible by a post-war appetite for modernism and mid-century screen printing techniques. There is a deeply cultural process at work here. Let's think for a moment, if we're thinking about history and culture, about the historical and cultural context from which public libraries emerged. The free library movement variously manifested itself in facilities and programs associated with mechanics institutes and school of arts um, movement in the early 19th century. These libraries were mainly sub subscription based and designed for working men who were really vital to the success of the Industrial Revolution. They weren't really free, in other words. You paid to use them and they were male only. The public library landscape, as we know it today, emerged in the 1850s. The first public library in Australia was the State Library of Victoria, which opened in 1856. But the legislation that governs your extended network of municipal libraries and others throughout Australia is a 20th century phenomenon. So we're talking about a relatively young movement here, a movement that's still evolving, has already had to adapt to remarkable change, and is now in a period of intense transition. The early public library movement was built on hard fought for reforms. There were people, Tories and, and the wealthy, who did not want public libraries to exist and who couldn't see the point of ordinary working people having access to knowledge. Likewise, public libraries have been innovating like crazy since they cleverly avoided their predicted demise in the 1990s. Jeanette and I will remember in 1995 developing scenarios for the State Library of New South Wales where we were grappling with assumptions that the public library as place was a dead concept. It was predicted that the cyber revolution, as it was called then, would displace the very um, concreteness and material character of public libraries. That's proven not to be true, as we'll hear particularly from Pilar and Brian later today. But how have you, as library leaders and uh, managers and, and li librarians, done this? From my perspective, it's by taking leadership of the digital domain. Oh, by the way, I've done a very um, inexact and unscientific graph here. Um, and noted that it's based on my imagination and complete ahistorical um, tendencies rather than any analysis. 
Uh, how have you done this? By taking leadership of the digital domain and not letting people do it for you, by collaborating and sharing resources, ideas and knowledge, by building new, vibrant, aesthetically rich, multifunctional library buildings and spaces, and by commissioning original research into the economic, social and now cultural benefits of libraries. This is an amazing innovation story and it confounds me. It confounds me that it's not been framed as such. So framing is important here. Framing is about ideas that allow people to understand what they're experiencing and giving language to those ideas, making them conscious. Uh, a case in point is in New South Wales, we're having an election on Saturday and the current uh, opposition leader announced last week 50 million for public libraries um, and made a statement about the importance of you know, the public library infrastructure. But then in explaining why this was uh, you know, an important announcement, uh, he said, oh, look, everyone likes to burrow down into a good book. And you just think, no, that's not the frame. That's not the frame that justifies that money and it's not the frame that really captures the hothouses of social and cultural capital that public libraries <coughs> represent. So framing is an innovation challenge, finding the frame that fits with your values, purpose and story and designing new ways to communicate it is innovative and there's more work to be done there. Now the next point, which I'm not going to bring up again, is about the core values and ideals that animate the public library project. And in speaking about that, I need to speak about the importance of public things. As part of the cultural research that Sally Gray and I did for the Creative Communities Report for State Library of Victoria and the Public Libraries Victoria Network, we thought deeply about the value and meaning of public things. Public things are a manifestation of caring, empathy and social responsibility. Public education, public parks, public infrastructure like transport, bridges and roads, public policies, laws and rules of fair play create an ecosystem within which private enterprise and individual citizens can flourish. Public things are at the heart of vibrant democracies. Clean air, healthy food, the ability to sit on a park bench in relative safety, free access to schools, libraries, beaches and museums, the knowledge that, oh, here we get down to the nitty gritty, sewerage, rubbish collection, law and order will be taken care of are public things we take for granted. In exchange for taxes and rates, we've made a pact with the state to extend a degree of protection and opportunity to every one of us regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender or wealth. So the quality of our everyday experience is informed and enhanced by public things. The private needs the public, just as much as the public needs the private. That's just in case you were thinking I was going to launch into a socialist rave. Uh, we all need the lubricating influence of cooperation, tolerance and respect, which are ultimately shaped by the act of nurturing and sharing public things. And in this thinking, I'm influenced by the Canadian-born but US-based academic Bonnie Honig, who in turn is influenced by British uh, mid-century psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst D.W. Winnicott and the great German philosopher Hannah Arendt. Yet public ownership over power, water, healthcare, education, training and transport is slipping through our hands. Agencies designed to protect the environment, house the homeless, provide shelter to women escaping domestic violence, train people in the skills needed for the economy or an economy in transition, or conduct independent scientific inquiry have either lost critical funding or been handed over to private interests. Public things are stridently demeaned and attacked by politicians, big business and private media barons who found it surprisingly easy to spin tales about the supposed superiority of all things private. The private, they argue, is more efficient, more capable, more balanced, more necessary, while the public is wasteful, bloated, bureaucratic and biased. Well, of course circumstances change and public things need to change too. 
public things are not inherently good, just as privately owned businesses are not inherently good or bad. But the sheer scale of this attack is breathtaking. That contemporary democracies, like the United States, like Canada, like the United Kingdom, like Australia, and judging from my favourite TV series, Borgen, even Denmark, have been so successful framing civil society as a free, self-regulating market of disciplined go-getting winners versus slovenly dependent losers. I know I'm on a roll here. Um, or in the current terminology, leaners versus lifters is a triumph of Orwellian doublespeak over all evidence to the contrary. Now, what would I know? I turn up in pink. And I think it's much better to trust someone who would know a professor of mathematics. Thomas Piketty's tour de force capitalist in the, capitalist, capital, capital in the 21st century shows us that inequality of wealth and opportunity is as great today, if not greater, than the late 18th century. In other words, the period in which the need for public libraries first emerged. Caring for and about public things reinforces civic maturity and optimism. Libraries are already instantiated as valuable public things within the public imagination. Therefore, it could be argued they assist communities to become more mature, resilient, generative, and innovative. Now, how do I know this? Am I just making it up? I don't think so. Research into the economic benefits uh, of public libraries show that citizens, and I think your own work has demonstrated this, as well as State Library of Victoria's work, that citizens are quite comfortable to pay for public libraries, even if they don't use them now. They want to know that they're there and that they're useful and meaningful to someone. This defies the efficiency and utility logic that we're asked to believe is self-evident. And number two, when asked in the right way, people say the most amazing things about public libraries, and I know this from my own research. If we draw on people's feelings, metaphors, associations, your clients are positively poetic in the way they describe the meaning of public libraries to their lives. They describe public libraries as, and I quote from my own research in Victoria, quiet, clever, curious, imperative, indispensable, vital, a safe place that demands nothing but offers everything a place where ideas fill the air. The library is like social glue, they say. It's like fungi, everywhere and thoroughly connected. It's even something delicate of extraordinary beauty. And, as one person said in a workshop I ran about a new regional library, it will be the new Nirvana. As a result of our research, Sally's and mine, into the cultural benefits of public libraries, we can, became convinced that public libraries, more than any other cultural institution, embody and nurture the qualities associated with well-functioning public things. They provide opportunities for new forms of participatory creativity. Yet the scale and depth of what's happening in your libraries is still largely invisible to people outside them. We presented six lenses. Oh, what's happened to you? Oh, anyway, we'll go back to that. We presented six lenses, which you'll I find in this, this um, report, through which you can understand and document the ways in which public libraries are doing this in your communities. And I won't talk about that here, but we can talk about that later. So, um, innovation, um, just hold on for a sec. Yes, I think I'm, I think I'm in the right place. Um, going on to number three, innovation as a conscious strategy, mindset and approach and discipline. Um, I'd like to say this, that what's happening in public libraries today is truly amazing. From here at the State Library of Queensland to Adelaide and to Aarhus in Denmark. From Birmingham, Edmonton, 
to, and Edmonton to Nova Scotia and Helsinki. From Kerrang, my favourite little library on the Murray, to Albury, to Geelong and to Katoomba, public libraries are experimenting with new ways to stay relevant and create value for diverse communities. Libraries invite people to make things, learn, interact with others, interpret collections in new ways, perform, read, work, relax, play, and even publish. The Danish scholars, Rasmussen, Jochumsen, and Scott Hansen, have presented an elegant model that describes the dimensions of the public library well. Called the four space model, it includes physical and virtual spaces for inspiration, learning, meeting, and a slightly uh, confused performance. They say that people are not only looking for something to sustain them these days, but something to live for. Contemporary libraries support concrete and metaphysical needs, they say, by providing opportunities for experience, involvement, empowerment, and innovation. Now, I don't run a public library, but I think if I, if I did, I think I'd find this conceptual framing device quite handy as a reference point for seeing innovation as a conscious strategy and discipline. And I don't think it matters what framework you use if you're thinking about transformation, innovation or creativity. Um, it's just having one that works for you and that you can stick with. But what I like particularly about these scholars and their Norwegian counterparts is that they've actually gathered evidence, publicly funded research-based evidence that's longitudinal in character and empirical. And so there's a kind of substantial aspect to the way that they think and what they're doing in helping public libraries. What I can do today, though, is present a few ideas about what I've done or my colleague Monica and I have done um, with library services around Australia and uh, in Asia, and what I've heard from my library colleagues and friends that might help strengthen this mindset for innovation. So here goes. Oh, that's just the Creative Communities Report. Fresh eyes. Now, it may, you know, one thing I've always thought is why don't we capture the kind of freshness that new people to our organisations bring when they arrive? And I'm sure some of you already do this. But it seems to me that new starters are gradually inducted into an organisation rather than utilised for the freshness that they bring to their new situation. Um, fresh eyes can unsettle us, but they can also improve what's working, uh, improve what's working and what's not working. I also like the idea, as many of you have done, of inviting young, old or in-betweens. I don't know where I fall these days, whether I'm an in-between or an old, but anyway, to map their experience of your library. And I'm, I, 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 I put the Harvard Business School down in a moment, but I'm just about to elevate it back into uh, my positive consciousness by saying that Harvard design students were invited into a library test kitchen recently in order to build the libraries of the future and reflect on the way they could better serve communities. And they came up with some really counterintuitive ideas like Wi-Fi cold spots. Think about that, Wi-Fi cold spots. It flips things, doesn't it? And electric campfires for those um, places, you know, where people plug in their computers and things like that. But just even using the language electric campfire sounds better than an electrical um, plug, you know, so that's that's cool. And also, performance artists can reinterpret libraries and bring spaces alive in new, unforgettable ways. I met some performance artists at Fitzroy Library in Melbourne, and they use the library for their various work. But they said, "Why don't you invite us in? Why don't we do a performance here? People will never see the space in the same way." So, uh, fresh eyes organisational chart reconceived in the messy uh, way that it usually works. Secondly, transitions. I'm a big fan of using transitions 
as a way of getting new ideas and bringing creativity into organisations? What kind of transitions, you may ask? Well, new buildings and spaces is the biggest transition of all. New systems processes, cutbacks, redundancies and closures uh, is another big one. And the, some, of the fact, some of the things that are associated with all of these transitions um, are that they stir up complex feelings of uncertainty, anger, loss, and sometimes resentment, but sometimes they stir up even hope. They unfreeze things, and they're in that act of unfreezing, they allow opportunities to see things differently. These feelings represent energy, and that energy can be harnessed for innovation. Two examples. Um, a few years ago, Monica and I did some work with the Victorian Government Libraries Network, and they were facing what you'd have to call a merger, or what you might call, what you probably call shared services. Anyway, what we did is we actually did these maps of experience where we asked the senior group to create these maps of how they felt and saw the situation at hand. I've got two of them here. And I love that swamp of apathy you know, rapids of redundancy. So it was about sort of turning what was actually happening but into a more imaginative way. And then we got the team leaders or the other team to create their own map of experience. And then we got them together to share those maps. And it was absolutely amazing um, the kinds of um, questions and discussion that emerged from that very creative process. Another one I heard recently at the Katoomba Public Library was um, they had a new library and uh, the manager went out and bought farm animals, little farm animals from a toy shop. And before the library opened or was finished, the fit out was finished, she had all the staff use the farm animals to mimic how people actually use the space. And on the basis of that kind of you know, play, they were able to actually calibrate the final design. Um, and people so loved their farm animals, they kept them forever. Language is another important aspect of innovation. Cognitive scientists say that 95% of thinking is unconscious. So reasoning is comprised of feelings, values and memories, and we need new ways to bring this kind of reasoning to the fore. Naming helps give language to ideas, but as, as we've seen, language can also deaden the senses or enliven them. I like the way that, that um, Anything Libraries in, um, is it Colorado or Colorado? They named, they changed the word volunteer to sidekick. And I like that, don't you? It's sort of a, a word that's become kind of frozen and dull, is animated. Um, some things don't work so well. I've just finished a, a bit of work with a Sydney um, a library service and we wanted to use something other than lifelong learning and I came up with this idea of the learning hive. You know, I had this whole thing about the hive and, you know, people working in the hive and it's all connected and da 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 da. Anyway, it was all great and, you know, very interesting. And then, of course, the director not the library director, the director of quite a conservative council just found that the library hive metaphor was a bridge too far and we scaled it back. But even just in the metaphoric use of hive uh, affected our thinking. So if finally in, in relation to language, I'm not a fan of ditching the word library itself. I think that time has passed and I think the word has powerful, well-earned cultural capital and should stay. Moments of M. Plotting moments of magic and moments of misery can also be an innovation experience. Monica and I did this a couple of years ago, and I've done it recently myself with a university library in Victoria. So basically what you do is you or other people outside the library plot how they would describe your moments of magic and your moments of misery. And the idea is obviously you flip the moments of misery into moments of magic and you make the moments of magic even more wonderful and magical. 
And the point is, there are lots of tools for how to do this, and we can talk about this this afternoon, but once again, it's about liberating language um, and shifting it away from more dead terms like re-engineering. And finally, well, that's one example of someone using the moments of magic, um, doing this reverse gear thing that we do where she's got, you know, acts of God and things like this. So it's cool. Um, sometimes I, I forget that I do these things. But, and last, uh, but not least, start from where you are. Everything is an opportunity to innovate. You can transform a place that's not right. For example, the, uh, the Aubrey Library Museum, which was located in the deadest part of town when it was built, although brilliant design, but which has turned that place, it's, it's actually moved the locus of activity in that city towards the library through its vibrancy and through its activities. Or you can fight for place. A small town like St Arnold in Victoria was almost split in two because, it was, because a group of people were prepared to fight for the right place for the library when in fact the council wanted to move it somewhere else. But when Paddy Manolis, a friend and colleague and CEO of Geelong Library Co Corporation, joined there eight years ago. Oh, sorry, this is Katoomba Library. And I just wanted to point out that there was a small innovation there uh, that I thought was really cool and small and close. And what they did was they had their, you know, the, what do you call them, the holds, where you hold the books for people. They cover every one of those holds in a, a their latest you know, library newsletter. And so every one of them looks like that. And you think, well, that's pretty cool. That's a way that you, sh you know, get people to know what's going on. But the reason was that they have high incidence of mental illness in that area. And they found that um, people felt more comfortable when they kind of co took their book out with the, a cover, like a, we used to have brown paper covers, um, rather than having their choices exposed to their community. And I thought that was a really small and close and sensitive uh, thing to do. But going back to Patty Manolis, um, when she joined that library service eight years ago, all indices were down. It was the poorest funded library service in Victoria. It, um, I should note that library corporations in Victoria are a little bit different from other states in the sense that they involve a number of councils collaborating together to share resources, so they can be quite big. She described it as the whole service as fusty, musty and dusty and there was a sense of urgency about change because otherwise they wouldn't have survived. She persisted with vision and an incredible community consultation process. Everything was examined but in a step-by-step, -step, small and close manner. Community workshops were held around 4,000 people, contributed to ideas about the future and there was a move away from rules uh, and a growing confidence about where to go next. Earlier this year, Geelong Library Corporation was named the most popular library, public library service in Victoria. And later this year, it will in unveil a new five-storey building, which I'm sure will become the Birmingham of the Southern Hemisphere. What Patty did with her staff was that she didn't specify the what that needed to be done. She specified the how. And the how was an uncompromising community focus. The what of how that was, you know, the what of what would be done was a collaborative endeavour. Okay. We never go straight to innovation educator Sir Ken Robinson insightfully argues. There is an act of imagination that brings into reality something previously hidden or latent. There is a creative process, either individual or collective, that puts imagination to work in the form of ideas. But it's generally collaboration that fuels innovation by putting these ideas at, to work and making them productive. At its nucleus, then, innovation as collaboration is a human process. 
It is people, after all, who come up with ideas, not processes, software, products or systems. It is people who make choices, take risks, who turn towards the new in the knowledge that changing things is never easy and staying the same is not an option. It is people like you who venture into the unknown, who tussle with adamantine institutional power, gritting your teeth sometimes for the inevitable backlash, having to put up with incomprehension and, worse, patronisation, because the things you have carriage of matter to the people who need them. It's people who bring the necessary attention, focus, patience and receptivity and imagination to bear on human needs and hopes in order to, to change or improve human lives. I've argued today that public libraries are vital public things and that their publicness occupies a special place in the public imagination. Their existence does not guarantee better or more cohesive communities or more heightened civic engagement, but our care of them, our capacity to extend their reach might support a virtuous cycle of social change rather than a vicious one. I've suggested that innovation is not some disembodied abstract concept, but a living, iterative human phenomenon that can't be templated. Actually, I think I've just made up that word. To be innovative is to give birth to something new, and new means new. Not something derivative or second-hand, not something proscribed by best practice. The new can comprise threads of what is already present, but innovation recombines and remixes these threads into something with forward momentum. To be innovative is to be of a place and time. The exigencies of place will shape the responses, materials, tools, thought process, processes, language and means with which to tackle the challenges at hand. And while I would never say anything as trite as welcome adversity, it is clear that challenges and constraints tend to impel people to find innovative solutions and responses, like people like Florence Broadhurst. So there is a logic to welcoming challenges and not being defeated by them. It's important, oh, it's the important leaps forward that synthesise lots of ideas, says New York Times writer Maggie Kurth Baker. And it's the belly up failures that teach us what not to do. When we ignore how innovation works, we make it hard to see what's happening right in front of us today, she continues all the little failures, trivialities and not quite solved mysteries that make the successes possible. This is what innovation looks like. It's messy and it's awesome. In my experience, not knowing what to do next is resolved by doing something. Small and close is where to start. Nothing extra is needed, except of course, a healthy dose of devout irreverence. Thank you.